unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Hebrews chapter 11. If you dare, say amen. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Next verse. And truly, if they have been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have not had an opportunity to have returned. Uh -huh. But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Next verse. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall I sit be called, uh -huh, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Say amen. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Bible says that the giftings and callings of God are without repentance, it means that God cannot take away the gift he has planted in a man's life. Amen. And it also means that God cannot take away the calling that he has put on a man's life. Give me the amplified of that. For, let's read, God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. He never withdraws them when once they are given. And he does not change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call. There are many people who say, um, me, the guy was anointed, and then he stole pancakes, and then the Lord took away the anointing, or this guy was very anointed, and then he killed a, a hog in the forest, and then God took away the call he had upon his life. But the Bible says that the giftings and callings of God are irrevocable. And the Bible says that he never withdraws them once they are given, and he does not change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace, or to whom he sends his call. Now, there's something very ironic about that. This is the irony about it. When a man is gifted to heal, whether he feels it or he doesn't feel it, whether he understands or he doesn't understand, whether he is stirred up or he doesn't, he's not stirred up, that man will heal. Because he's functioning by either the gift of God upon his life or the calling of God upon his life. Now, let me tell you something about the gift and calling. Because they are irrevocable. And the Bible says that he does not withdraw them from whom the man puts. Even if that man doesn't pray, the gift stays. Even if that man does not fast, if it's a gift, it will flow. Why? Because the gifts and callings of God flow against it of people, not the position of the deliverer. You get my point? You see, when the Bible says that the wisdom of the prudent is to know the way of the Lord, the way of the Lord does not reveal the tactics by which he functions through his servants. The way of the Lord reveals the strategies by which God reveals works through his servants. Strategies and tactics are two different things. Something tactical might not necessarily be strategic. Do you understand what I mean? Yet, something strategic must in some way have tactic in it for it to have the full-fledged definition of what it means to be strategic. So, if I am called to preach, even if you wake me up in 3 a.m. in the morning and tell me, preach, I will what? Preach, because I'm to preach. Even if you wake me up at 4 a.m. in the morning, I will preach and the power of God will flow, because I'm entirely functioning on the gift and calling of God upon my life. You get my point? It's like a musician. 
even if a musician takes drugs, they're still musicians. Because song is intellect. Song is intelligence. You know, the human mind identifies these extra talents on a man as intelligence. Singing is an intelligence. If a man's part of the brain is developed in that kind of intelligence, that man can sing. But there's some people who can't sing. If you can't sing, it means that that part of your brain is not fully developed. Are you hearing me? Like certain people can't dance. You can have a bit like poo, 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 poo. But for them in their head, their head registers poo, 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 poo. So the poo, poo, you find somewhere like poo, 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 you know? So come back to what I was trying to say. So the Bible says that when the giftings and callings of God are without repentance, it means whether I fast or I don't fast, the gift of God will work on me, if it's a gift. And if I fast or not fast, the calling of God will work on me. You were a prophet before you fasted. And you will stay a prophet even if you don't fast. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So the place where we men provide gifts or respond to callings can be very deceptive as a man starts to grow in God in line with a place called ministry. Now the kind of someone that I'm preaching right now might not be too beneficial for the person who has just gotten born again or who doesn't even have anything that being in the gospel. But one day when you grow up and these things settle in your spirits, they will cause understanding. I'm preaching things some of you are going to take 10 years to understand, some of you are going to take 15 years to understand, some of you are going to take 20 years to understand. You might even walk out of this room with a thought that you understood this ground, sorry, but you might not have understood as you think you should understand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, for example, if the Lord has called you to be a teacher of the Word, okay, if the teaching to every degree and by reason of the calling person, it means that it will come with every grace to provide for me as a teacher of the Word, and I will teach it whether I feel it or I don't feel it, whether I am in the mood or I'm not in the mood. Man is dealing with the gifts and callings of the Spirit. There's something amazing when it comes to how they flow out, they flow out so naturally out of him that he need not to struggle through. Every time you see a minister struggle on something, or Christian, many a time, many of those Christians are not necessarily called in the thing they are. They just covet to move in that particular gift. Even though in the things of the spirit, there is such a thing as covet the best gifts. It means that people who are not necessarily born with a particular gift of faith, for example, but the Bible has allowed us to covet the gift of faith, and therefore you covet that gift of faith, and then it starts to come to you. When you're in that process of that gift being translated to material, where well, really it should work in your life, in some of those instances, there might be struggles for you to connect the spiritual vibes of the same. But over time, by reason of exercising, the Bible says they have exercised their senses to discern what is good and evil. The place of exercise for a man trying to adopt what was not predominantly on them is that they make mistakes and make good things wherein, okay? That is why the exercised senses of the book of Hebrews speak of places where men discern both good and evil. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason why there's a place of designing of two worlds is because if you're adopting from something that you just asked, you realize that you're bound to make mistakes because it's not something naturally in you. That's perhaps the difference between probably a Cristiano Ronaldo and a Lionel Messi. Cristiano Ronaldo, they tell you, is a very hard worker. And because he's a very hard worker, they tell you that this guy is one of the last guys to leave uh, the pitch. So every evening while his friends are rehearsing, I mean practicing, and when they finish practicing, He's always in the back trying to throw a few. Yeah? Why? Because he's exercising. When he exercises his senses, he becomes better. And as he becomes better, you could say, I could say, everyone could say that Cristiano Ronaldo is a very good player. Okay? But to the degree of player, there is a place where his talent can't go. So, it's the same thing here. He, Ronaldo, might practice every night what is too natural with. Messi. Messi will just get up. It's just inside his system. It's like musicians, for example. Let me give you an example. Okay, choir. There are people who are so good with song that 
you just bring any tone and intonate it in any form, they will bring it out. You understand? Then there are those ones who are flat singers, and they are good. Then there are those ones who are lost in keys. Then there are those ones who have many keys. Then there are those ones who are keyless. They can flip in and out of any key any time. <laughs> you understand? So if you find that kind of musician, they're natural. They don't wake up in the morning and they say, I'm going to start singing good. You can never practice to be a good musician. Okay? If you do practice, I, like I, when I was growing up, I used to find guys who do vocal trainings. Eh? Hey, I don't live along the cores of chameleon. There are people who used to go on, on mountains and then they scream, ah! You know, and then they start to, ah! Then they take eggs. Then they eat avocado. Then they eat bananas. Then they eat honey. You understand? Why? They want to have a Celine Dion or Maria Carey. <laughs> you remember those days? And then you find some people, they don't need to eat it. The guy can just wake up in his sleep, perhaps even took bush the last night, who even in two days, one of those thick things that I funny, they, they, they even misplaced and displaced. But man, brother, the guy can just wake up in the morning and just flow. Why? Because in whom one it's natural, in another it's by reason of exercise. Praise the Lord. So if we're speaking of the coveted gift, which is not predominantly something that was original in the man, you realize that that man will have a certain line of effort to yield to exercising his senses. And as he exercises his senses, there are ways he grows. Okay? Are we together? But in the place where the man exercises his senses to be where he is in the gift that he has prospered in, or the calling that he has prospered in, again, the scriptures have told you that the giftings and callings of God are without repentance the bible says in amplified they are irrevocable he does not withdraw them from whom he gives and god taketh not his grace upon whom he has put it on hallelujah but then therein is one of the most um sensitive things i want to share with you in a few minutes when you function for so long under the giftings and callings you might and will be vindicated enough to be called a man of God because the Lord has put a seal of ownership upon your life by the gift and calling on your life. And many Christians have ministered that far to the place of the gift of God upon their lives. Until one time the Lord started to teach me something. When the Bible says that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance, you must also understand that there's a part in the gift and a part in the in the calling wherewith a man will never have control if i'm talking of a gift of faith even if that day i woke up and i don't believe it's if it's the gift working in me he will produce certain results wherewith i will have no control and men will come out of that meeting saying surely this guy has god upon his life because there was no application anywhere or in any form to control or orchestrate a certain platform for this thing to go. It just goes. If you have met a gifted preacher, and they are gifted by God to preach, the moment they get on that pulpit, they don't have control of the things that come out of their mouths. They just flow. Because these things are natural in them. Are you with me? But there is a plane in God wherewith the gifts and callings have no application to the vindication of the things a man will define as ministry because God has called us to function above gifts and callings with those gifts and callings present. So I'm not speaking of a situation where I'm functioning above the gifts and callings because I have dealt away with them, I'm talking of a place where on top of the gift and calling of God upon your life, God puts something above it. Hallelujah. And so there are certain portions of scriptures. There is a place in God where the man ministers above the gifts and callings, but without necessarily ruling out the gifts and the callings upon your life. Now, for example, scriptures like, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. The Bible says that you shall ask what you will and it shall be done. That platform in the spirit 
has nothing to do with the gift and with the calling. It has everything to do with the man's abiding in the spirit. Are you hearing me? But a man can create a certain life of advancing so much in the gift and calling of God upon their lives that they might be mistaken for men which abide for long for the Spirit of God to dwell and work through them. Because many a time we know not how to discern the advancement and increase and multiplication and exponential growth of the gift or the call on the man's life versus the time that the man has spent in the presence of God in what you want or must call abiding. And that is why we have a generation that entirely spends extensively on the gifts on their lives versus the place of abiding in God. But here is the difference. When you're functioning with the gifts and callings, it's entirely the functioning of the mind of the Spirit on you. But when you function in the dispensation of abiding, it's entirely the mind of God, the mind of God trusting your mind enough for you to will because you've been metamorphosed through the process of dwelling in the presence of God long enough that you can't come out with any private or individual interpretation of the things of the Spirit or can waste any of those things to your personal lust. But it's entirely yielded to the mind and intention, divine purpose of God, that anything that comes out of your spirit as will is 100% the will of God, that when you are praying, it has nothing to do with will. It has everything to do with the ultimate will, the use of the name Jesus. And the moment that name is used, every knee bows of the things in the earth, of the things under earth, and the things in the heaven, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. They is a distinction of function in God where we the man goes past above the gift, past above the calling to the place of abiding. When a man learns to abide, even if he's not necessarily in the place of the gifting and calling or even further to that degree, the scriptures speak of a man called Cornelius. The Bible says that he was an Italian fellow. He was not of the root of the Jews. He knew nothing about being Jewish. God had come to the Jews, visited the Jews, given them everything as according to the promise that he made to their forefathers. And then there is this Italian fellow who is so different. The Bible says that he loved the Lord and gave much alms. Hallelujah. And the Bible says that he fasted. He was a devout fellow. But Cornelius abided in the presence of God until the heavens had to manifest an angelic being before that man. Not because he was gifted to be prophet, but because he dwelt so deep that the spirit world had to become too visible to him. Now there are such as people which see the prophetic, which see sorry, the angelics because they are prophets. So if a prophet tells me I was in the spirit realm on this day and the prophet, the of the Lord appeared unto me. That is wonderful because you're speaking for it or about it because of the calling of God upon your life. There is a necessity of the angelics to appear to you. But I'm talking of a man who by reason of abiding has pushed beyond the borders and behind the veils of time that God has to dispense him in a place where eternal things become too visible before his physical eyes. Cornelius did not behold the Christ with spiritual eyes. This was not a man who had spiritual, spiritual eyes to behold an angelic being, to pull that from a spiritual perspective, to testify of a physical experience. No, this was a soul entirely reaching out to God, that God had to move to a certain degree where the angelics had to appear to Cornelius. That when Peter comes to the house of Paul, of, of, of Cornelius eventually, and he's preaching this gospel and he's explaining his story, and the house of Cornelius is filled with the Holy Spirit, you realize Peter says one 
sensitive thing. He says that now of a truth I perceive. He didn't say now of a truth I realize. It is something that was also revealed to Peter in the spirit. He says now of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. God is no respecter of the callings. God is no respecter of the gifts. But God is a respecter of men who come, who just come. The gift is wonderful because it doesn't require a man to come. It's already with the man. But there's a place in God where, 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 where a man just comes. He just comes. He just comes and that's it. Cornelius was not, the scriptures don't tell us that he understood God to the degree the apostles did. But the scriptures truly tell us that Cornelius abided in God. And so when the scripture says that if you abide in me and my words abide in you, he says, ye shall ask whatsoever ye will and it shall be done. It shall be done. There's a distribution in God I have seen that goes above what we are called to do and goes above what we are gifted to do to the place where I want to explain something, but I don't know whether I have the language. Let me give you an example. Let me just give you an example. There are people who are gifted to heal the sick. Are you hearing me? And they can minister to bodies and the souls of the sick. But those people might never have the ability to minister to spirits. Because the spirits we minister to are incorruptible. Do you understand what I mean? The spirits we minister to are one with the Lord. The Bible says that he that is joined together with the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. The spirits that we minister to have logos in them. You're not speaking to lost men trying to get you. You're speaking to men who understand you before you even explain yourself. Now, somebody can say, but what they're speaking, I don't understand. Yes, what I'm speaking to you, you might not understand. But what will you bring you back tomorrow is because what I'm speaking to you transcends past the understanding of your mind and ministers to you. The Amplified Bible calls them the most holy emotions. And that's persuading you. So when Paul says that I did not come to preach this gospel in the words that were persuasive, in, 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 in the words of persuasive men, you understand? In the words of persuasive men, it means that there's a place in the gospel where men can persuade by reason of the gift. But there's a place in God that goes past the persuasion of, of, of the gift on the man to the place where the Bible says he ministereth to the minds of the hearers, the most holy emotions, and thus persuading them. The place where persuasion comes when we get into the men or women of God and make them understand, like the spirit the soul has emotions. The soul is the seat of human emotions. The spirit also has certain emotions. But the emotions of the spirit cannot be ministered or cannot be stirred up by reason of the gift on the man. The emotions on the spirit can only be stirred up by the spirit of that man which has learned to abide in God, to speak things that no man can ever search out. The thing that creates emotions in our spirits is different from the things that create emotions in our souls. The spirit that creates, it, the, the ministry that creates emotion in our souls is the thing that we can connect by reason to appeal to anything that makes us human. The ministration that appeals to the emotions of the spirit man are the things that we connect by reasoning that make us gods. But then our lines of offense are in the place where we realize. Do you realize that when, 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 I, when I act like a human being because somebody has fallen down, you understand? Like when the Christ said, mourn with them which mourn. Are you hearing me? That is Jesus trying to speak about the emotion of a man. That when you see somebody dead and you find people which are the vigil, weep with them. Are you hearing me? But you see, there is something that makes the Christ above a weeping. That after weeping, he will ask and say, where have you laid him? Why? He's weeping because he realizes that they carry unbelief. But the place of the emotions in the soul might not necessarily 
testify the Christ which is living and alive but he has to look for the grave where it is because at that particular time when he reaches the grave he cannot wait for Lazarus to return back he left that in the presence of Martha and Mary but when he faces Lazarus at that particular time there is a voice that comes out of that guy and it is not emotional anymore it is directional it has an authority to it it is commanding hey now he says concerning the works of my hands command ye me gifted men never understand those lines because sometimes the gifts still carry certain emotions that appeal to the soul hallelujah and not that it is bad to function in the soulish realm no but that it is a very dangerous thing for a man to only carry emotions in the soul because when a man learns to carry emotions in the spirit you realize that you start to feel after god that's the issue of Hebrews. he says that he has made of all nations from that one blood of all nations and all tribes right <laughs> has made of one blood all nations and of all men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and what? Find him! There's a place that finds God because a man is feeling after and there's a place that finds God because a man is just emotionally attached in the soul. I'm talking of a place that goes beyond emotionally in the soul. I'm talking of a place that goes above the gifts and callings on your life for God to respond. I'm talking of a place that puts a man in the heart of God that that man starts to feel like. That when you're preaching the gospel to the lost, you're not preaching it because you are called an evangelist to preach. But when you're preaching the gospel to the lost, you feel the pain of the lost. You feel the hunger of the lost. That when you're ministering to a sick man, you're not just ministering to them because you're gifted to heal the sick and you feel sorry for them emotionally. But you minister to them past the place of them feeling pain, to the place of understanding what the devil has done. That, that holy anger that stirs up in your spirit, it's emotional, yes. But it is in the spirit. It is not soulish. So when you have ministers who don't feel after God, they can still function by gift, still function by the calling, but not feel after. And that is why you see certain men who are so gifted, but use their gifting to benefit themselves, and they are not after Christ. That is why a man can prophesy, and after that, carry as much money as he can out of people. That is why a man can teach and preach and do many things and then after that use that as an advantage to carry millions out, one million, stand here, two million. The reason why some of those men do that is because, very simple, there's a certain plane that they've not gotten to. A man can't abide in God and be cautious of lack. And if he's not cautious of lack, how will he tell people, bring a hundred million? Because he, the place where he abides, are you hearing me? Is the place that, he, that drew God near. The Bible says that they might feel after him, if happily they should find him, though he be no far. God is not far from anybody here. No, men are far from God. I don't know if you get the difference. God is not far from us. We are far from him. These things were not far from men. No. Certain men were, were very far from them. There's a difference. God is more desperate to move in our generation than we are desperate to contain. That, that is why... I wish you understand what I mean here. I have learned one thing over the past, and I must promise you this. There's going to be many teachers in this world there's going to be many preachers in this world. There's going to be many prophets in this world. There's going to be many evangelists in this world. There's going to be many worshippers in this world. There's going to be many kinds of ministers in this world. But there will always be a separation and distinction on men who minister past the gift and calling of God upon their lives to the very line of the source from where they carry God to minister to the world. 
you can minister to the degree of the gift of God upon your life and it can increase in your life by reason of you exercising yourself to the place where by your spiritual intellect your spiritual cognitive processes learn to adapt the place where we exercise senses to design is different from the place where when we exercise senses to design we realize that these designments carry a feeling of the heart of god but what we minister to men more than just what is designed it comes with a certain feel after in God, that it's not wasted as pulse to swine. Because I've seen, you see, some people don't understand that it's only one, it's one thing for us to cast pulse to swine. It's another, when swine minister pulse? When pa swine minister pulse? The point is, they've already trampled on it. So they release it as one which is trampled over. Not because it's not useful, but because they do not know that it's useful. They don't discern that it is useful. That is why certain people, even in the gifts they carry, they can become arrogant, they can become indifferent, they can become funny, they can become proud, because they don't really know what they have. They don't really know what they have. They don't really know what they carry. They don't really know who works in them. They don't really have an appreciation. They are blind from those kinds of things. Hallelujah. Until I realize one thing that I want to submit to you this evening before I finish. When I met God on that level, I realized one thing. That I have a gift on my life, and I have a calling on my life, but I want to minister in this way. I want a place where, with a gift and calling, I can more deeply cultivate a relationship with God. And out of that relationship with God, minister to men. That the gift working in my life will come with a relationship. That the call working on my life will come with a relationship. That men won't vindicate me, you understand, only with the seal of apostleship upon their lives. But they will walk back with the burden of the apostolic on their spirit. That is the difference between just preaching to be vindicated by men that you are deep. But that place that takes a man back to their closet to pray. That place that makes a man lose appetite and sleep because they had something way deeper than just a vindication in the spirit of the officers that we carry. That place that will make that person lose appetite, lose sleep, lose peace, lose friends. Count everything but dross for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. And count all things but damn that he may win Christ. That place where I'll stir up in the man the most holy emotions. That when I was preaching, they saw more than a preacher. They saw God in the gift. That when I was ministering, they saw more than the minister. They saw the call. But behind the call, they saw a God deeper than the call. That the end of my ministry is not an apostle. The end of my ministry is the heart of God. The end of my ministry is not just a gift to heal. The end of my ministry is the ministration of God. That when men look at you, they don't see an apostle. They see a God. They don't see a preacher. They see a God. They don't see a teacher. They see a God. Why? Because the message became a burden. It was not dispensed out of just the normal man to say, I'm gifted to preach. No. That gift came with a price. And that price came with a burden. Paul gets to that dispensation and realizes he cannot preach anymore because he has the gift and the calling to lay the foundation. He preaches now because law unto him if he preach not the gospel. He preaches because necessity is laid on him to preach the gospel. War unto me, necessity is laid upon me because what I carry on my life is deeper than a good preacher trying to earn lunch or a meal. What I carry on my life is the very burden of God himself trying to reach out to his people to say, I am still God. I'm alive and well. I love you. I can make you feel ways that no man can ever feel you. And thereby we minister the most holy emotions to the lives of men and thus persuading them. Did I tell anybody to pray? Did I tell anybody to pray? Did I lay hands on them? Have I laid hands on them? No. 
are they just emotional beings? You be disappoint you you be you be listen. Some of you you're just indifferent. That's why you don't even know whether you should pray or you shouldn't pray. Because you 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 have been ministered to in the in the solace realm for so long that that you, you don't understand what it means for you see, it's one thing when 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 a soul panteth after God. It's another when a spirit panteth after God. Because when a soul panteth after God, it opens its mouth and heart to what it expects but might not fully apprehend. But when a spirit panteth after God, it has seen the end of those things. It knows how things must go. It, it, listen, there are people here who are just believing God revival. They just believe God for revolution. But there is another man in the spirit who is not believing God for revolution only or revival only. There is a man who has seen the end of those things and he wants to have a part because the gospel in our lives individually is a part. That is why the Bible says in the book of Revelation that if any man miss the word in any of these, his part shall be rubbed out. And therefore I seek God not because I'm an apostle, not because I'm a teacher, but because I have a part in the gospel. I have a part. I have a part. So then, let God work in me. Deeper than just the gift of God upon my life. Deeper than just the calling of God upon my life. But to the depths where He will minister from the relationship that I share with Him. Because when I do, to the end of it, when men judge my ministry, they will see that above that gift, there was a God. And that's when I realized that the unsearchable things begin from there. Things no man can search out. You see, when God is anointing and distributing gifts to men, he can minister to them in degrees and forms as they desire the very gifts. And he will deliver this, those gifts, work in the lives of those gifts, of those men as, they, as he ought to. But when the Bible says that desire the best gifts, it meant out that there was a deliberate searching out. And the things that could be searched out were around the gifts. But when we go to the things in God which are unsearchable, you realize that these things are distributed to men who pass gift and calling have availed themselves for a particular relationship with God. And when God is distributing such things, he knows when he puts it on their spirit, every man will hear it and know. This was not gotten from a book. This was not read on, 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 on Google. It wasn't listened to from a certain album it wasn't seen on a certain video it wasn't listened to from a certain man of god it was entirely fresh and it was distributed entirely in places that no man can ever search out because i realize this places of unsearchable things are places of men who are entirely abiding and yielded to god when a man yields to god you start to access the unsearchable things. And if a man might by gift try to search out those very things, he will always get to the end, and in the end he will find you. And that is the thing of all the men of old tried to do in Peter. He says that the prophets of old searched out diligently of what manner of the Spirit of Christ and what he did signify. To whom it was revealed when they were searching out, that unto us they did minister those things. Which things, Peter says, are preached to you in the gospel. They went out to search. And when they searched out, the end of search, they found a Christian. The born again. And from there, the Lord closed them there. Because the rest of the things to be revealed after were unsearchable by reason of nature. Now, even in the born again faith, when a man says, I'm searching out, he can search out in anything called gifting. But when it comes to a place of the unsearchable things, the gift ends. The gift ends. Anything in the gift is searchable. But the things above gifts, they are not searchable. They are just asked for. 
And that is why he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, he says, ask what ye will and I shall give it. In that dispensation, it goes past what God thinks about you to what you think about you. You ask what you want. You ask what ye will and it shall be done. Those are the people the scriptures say have turned the world upside down. In fact, right renderings should be right side up. And the Bible says that the foundations of the earth are without cause. They've fallen out of course. Because they neither have understanding, neither have knowledge. For he says, but I say that ye are gods. I say that ye are gods. Their understanding is darkened. There is no knowledge in them. But because knowledge comes and understanding is coming in our generation, you realize that God is calling men which got beyond what am I preaching on Thursday what am I preaching on Wednesday to the place where they can be carried by the spirit to the to the foundations of the earth and when they go to the foundations of the earth they can see the things most necessary and that is why I realize that there are men who minister on other men's foundations because some of those men don't even have a clue how the foundations stand and then the Bible says you entered in other men's labors you have gone into what men labor to have. And that is why I realize that the primary place of the true laborers in the spirit begins when men can travel past the ends of time to the places of understanding. What are the things that make salvation what it is? What are the things that if preached in the earth, they still hope that the Christ will move? What are those things that Christianity dwells on? You might call them pillars, call them everything that you want, but many men don't really minister from that perspective. And that is why some of you, if you're tomorrow going to become ministers, let me warn you one thing about God. The place of ministry begins when a man gets the entirety of the message. That when you come on the earth, you might preach a million sermons, but it will be one message. That is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Ladies and gentlemen, the next move of the Spirit belongs to men who abide. Because the times and gifts and functions of God, the move of the Spirit that is coming in the end time, is going to come entirely on men who are learning to abide. People who you don't say pray, people who will go always in their bedroom and lock themselves up. They might not even speak anything. But they'll just tell God, I'm here, and you're there, and that suffices. And they'll stay in there for hours, for days, for moments. But when they come out, brother, you're going to see more than gifts and callings. You will see God himself moving. Why? Because whether they release the anointing or they don't, God will be too desperate to release deeper that everything they shall receive back like Abraham shall be received back in a figure because in its own it is too dead to self for the man to glory therein except Christ. If I go past this point some of you will run mad because I'm starting to process certain things that are too crazy. They are too crazy. They are too crazy. They're too crazy. Now I understand why he is like a tree planted by the riverside. And he shall produce his fruit in his own season. That place that creates your own season and your own fruit. That you will have something that Africa can't have. You'll have something that Asia can't have. You'll have something that Europe can't have. I mean, people will say, this is a season of famine. And Elijah will feed by a certain raven. Yet the very man stopped the rain at his own word. And the heavens won't complain that Elijah is selfish. Because he's too aligned in a certain dwelling in the spirit. Where we, he that is spiritual, is not judged. But yet he judges all things. I, I, I don't want to go. I, I'm, I'm running a bit crazy. That place where things are just judged. And you're not judged. 
because you're past any judgment. If anything should come to judge you, it needs to move to a certain plane where you are. And nothing can move to that plane and not change form to spiritual. And if indeed it changes form to spiritual, nothing that can harm you can get to that realm. Why? God destroys it. The Bible says that the seal of the Lord shall perform this. There are things that will work in your life where it will go beyond what you hunger for. And it will go to the place where it is God himself hungering. Because when he sat in your life, he, 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 oh, it was no longer your hunger that moved God. It was entirely his hunger. Because it's not a human being hungry for God. It is God in the human being hungry. That is the very spirit that gets in Solomon asleep. And it makes a covenant with him. Yet it knows he's not reasoning. Prevenient grace. Prevenient grace. Such things produce a certain grace of having something upon your life that no man can ever have. Even if they try to be like you, they can never be like you. Because from the source where you got it, it had to define the manifold wisdoms of God. They can only be you. They can never be a man like you. Even if they try to be like you, they will never be exactly like you. Because they can follow us to the gifts. But when we get to the place where the gift Isaac is open unto God, and it has to return to Abraham in a figure, you will understand that when Isaac returns in a figure, it is in Isaac that your seed is called. And Luke 8, 11 said that the seed is the word. That place where the word coming out is coming out from the man Isaac, which was received in a figure because he was put on a particular altar and he died. Our message is no longer on gifts and calling only. It has a place where a certain altar burnt front and back we're not like Ephraim who's burnt on one side we were burnt on both ends but the end of our ministry now to men will appear like a burnt offering now I understand why Paul says that now I am poured out like an offering now I understand why when we offered ourselves as living sacrifices it was only to the degree that the living sacrifices will be consumed by a certain fire that they burn so hard that when they come off, they will come off as dead living. Now Paul sees it and he says, I'm dead, but yet I live. Because of the transition of the living sacrifice dying and out of that death it gets another life. And Paul realizes I'm dead. But yet I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who freely gave himself for me. That's And the Bible says he received Isaac as a figure. And that is the figure in which the seed shall be called in which the message shall be called because we had messages that were not called they didn't have a name to them the bible says that they called it manna because they knew not what it was and this jesus comes in john and says your 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 your, your fathers gave you manna but that is not what which is from above this which is from above has a name it is called the bread of life it is called jesus christ the first and the last, the one which shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehendeth him not. He becomes flesh, dwells among men, we behold his only glory, as the only true Son of God, full of grace and truth. And that's the place where the fivefold is distributed, and they were given prophets, pastors, evangelists, each for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, to the edification of the body, until we all reach to the full state, all of us, all of us to the full measure of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we might not be as babes tossed to and fro by all waves of doctrine, and that we might grow in Him in all things. All things. All things. How can we go in, grow into Him in all things? 
and still be called Grace Rogers Peter? And how can we be in that dispensation and men judge us? Now I understand why Joshua had to bury the 12 stones. That when he was entering the, the new land, the stones that he was carrying were different from the ones he was burying. They were both 12, and that's okay. But the ones that were living and not buried are the ones which the Christ finds on the sea. And he says that if you will not worship me, these ones, these 12 that Joshua put, because he, the, the very place, the very place, the very place from where he spoke is the very place where Joshua threw those stones. We're not talking of stones that are buried. I'm not talking of things that are in bushels and hid out, that, that lights are shining but are under a bushel. No. He says that that which is hid shall be revealed. He's talking of a dispensation where what is buried has to come out. Oh, a certain man has to move in another land and find things are intentionally and were intentionally not buried because they needed to shine. They were the light of the earth. They were that city set on a hill. Abiding God. Somebody raise your hands and speak in other tongues. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.